This is a Tibet House member video and is a part of the Force for Good class series, now available at tibethouse.us. Okay, so we're going to do Lamrim now. Are we starting? How many of you have already studied Lamrim? Okay, you have. <laughs> Everybody who's ever studied Buddhism has studied Lamrim, but sort of in the particular Tibetan stuff. Why is the Tibetan thing Lamrim called Lamrim? <coughs> the stages of the path of uh, the Bodhisattva or of enlightenment. <coughs> this is a. It used to be called, before Dongkapa's time, it used to be called Ten Rim Chemo, the stages of the teaching. And uh, he, he said he modeled Jadam Rishi Dongkapa, who wrote his um, version of Lam Rim Chemo, the great stages of the path. He wrote it in the um, early 15th century, in the first decade of the 15th century when he was at uh, Redding Monastery, which was the monastery founded by Dom Dumba, uh, who was the first um, Tibetan disciple of Atisha, the great, the great Bengali master, and um, who is considered in the tradition to have been the first incarnation of the Dalai Lama line of, uh, Tibet, of, uh, of uh, Avalokiteshvara incarnations. And... Uh, Although he's not called Dalai Lama I, they only start after Tsongkhapa's time with Gendun Drupa, in the, who was born in 1392. And Dom Dumba was born in the 11th century. Uh, and there, I think the reason that the Lamrim organizes the same teachings that are in Nagarjuna's Ratnavali, Jewel Garland, right, or in, which is his path book, or Shantideva's Bodhicharya Avatara, uh, and a number of other books, uh, Maitreya's Abhisamaya Lankara. The reason that uh, it's, it's um, the way it is, compressed in the way it is, the whole Mahayana path, is it's in the context of Tibet's having discovered and cherishing the Tantras, which as the crown jewel of all of Buddhist teaching, and of the, the, those teachings that make a human lifetime most worthwhile because of their ability to help a human being who is so motivated and has the requisite understanding to sort of hasten their achievement of Buddhahood itself, not just sainthood or some taste of enlightenment, some taste of nirvana, but actual Buddhahood with all of its uh, abilities and its experiences and so on, which, you know, doesn't sound like a big deal to us because we're still thinking that enlightenment is just something that happens to somebody in their body. You know, they have a kind of idea in their mind, a new insider idea in their mind in the same old body, but that's not what enlightenment is. As defined in Mahayana, enlightenment is a complete transformation of a being, physical and mental, 100%, into this incredible body where <clears throat> your body is the universe. <laughs> And then you, you enjoy having some sort of something relationally differentiable from the universe, which can really kind of is your enjoyment of being one with the universe, your own personal enjoyment of that. So since that, of course, that was created and discovered in India, and from the Tibetan point of view, uh, was taught by Buddha. For example, Buddha didn't teach the Prajnaparamita Sutras in the Tibetan notion of a biography. Uh, or rather, he, 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 his sort of final teaching of the Prajnaparamita Sutras was when he was fairly elderly. And at the same time as he taught the Prajnaparamita Sutras in Rajagurha on Vulture Peak, in the body of Kalachakra Buddha, he taught uh, the Kalachakra Tantra in South India, in what is now Andhra Pradesh, in a town called Amaravati. And so he was simultaneously teaching in two different bodies, 
which is not that extraordinary in Mahayana view. For example, when Buddha teaches Prajnaparamita, even in the 25,000 verse Prajnaparamita, before he teaches, he sticks out this huge tongue that a Buddha has. Buddha has a tongue. Again, this is a good way you can test your gurus. They have to be able to touch their hairline with the tip of their tongue. They have to touch there. And then also when the, the, it unfolded, the tongue covers the entire face. So it's rather broad also, the tongue. <laughs> really quite a tongue. And uh, <clears throat> so anybody who doesn't measure up tongue-wise, forget about it. <laughs> uh, so that's among other things, you know, among other physical attributes of a perfect Buddha. So, so because of that discovery of Tantra, then the Lemrim is considered the most important way to organize the most important teachings or themes of teaching that one uses to achieve, um, to get ready to prepare oneself to be able to enter the tantras. And uh, sort of then they have all kind of very careful definition of when you have minimum understanding and what minimum understanding you need to have to do that. And for example, um, in the case of uh, renunciation, you know, the three principles of the path, the book, what I'm looking for here is the three principal paths, principles of the path. I forgot what, where I printed it as a whole. I put verses in this anthology that I did years ago. But where did I put the thing as a whole? I think early on, first occurrence. No, not that's a, that's the... That is the Lama Chippa. Maybe, where did I first put it? Meeting the Buddha and the Mentor. I don't know if anybody knows that. No, I'm doing segments here. And um, well, I, know, I know what it is by heart. Oh yeah, I think it's here. Yeah, here it is. On pages 112 and 113, those who have this book. Central Tibetan Buddhism book I did a long time ago, called The Three Principles of the Path. And the three principles of the path are called transcendent renunciation or transcendence, simply by me, at least, and universal compassion and the spirit of enlightenment is the second one. And the third one is the wisdom of the twofold selflessness. So renunciation or transcendent, transcendent renunciation, universal compassion, and the twofold, wisdom of twofold selflessness, which means the wisdom that understands the nature of reality. So those are the three principles of the path. And the first one, transcendence, that is essential. You know, you, if you, in regard to Tantra, if you hear about Tantra, those of you, I bet a lot of you have heard about Tantra, if not already practice it, and one of the things people advertise Tantra about is they say, well, you use passions in the path. You can use anger in the path. You can use delusion in the path. You, know, you can use what are normally addictive mental states or mental addictions, what I call mental addictions, the kleshas. You can use those kleshas, uh, transmute the energy, and then use them in the path rather than just suppress them, which in the exoteric system you're supposed to kind of control them or suppress them. So then everyone gets all excited about that, the idea of using passion in the path, of various kinds of passions and delusions in the path. But the point is, you can't use the raw material in the path. In other words, at the, if it's still the level where they have you under their spell, you're not going to be using anything. They're going to still be using you. And this, of course, is one of the reasons Tantra is esoteric. Because if people right away go into sort of indulging their passions by thinking that I'm doing Tantra, they're going to go nuts. And so <clears throat> to protect them, it's esoteric, not just to hide something from them, but to protect them. So the first level of the first principle of the path, transcendent renunciation, a person has to have achieved a certain distance from their mental addictions so that they already know through kind of mindfulness, through a kind of a self-analysis, through a, an examination of the nature of the passions that <clears throat> when anger or lust or delusion grips you, where you feel helpless in its flow, then you are not able to use that anger or that lust or passion or delusion. You can't use it because it's using you. 
It's just driving you, and, and there's no way you can practice that tundra. So you have to have renounced a little bit that you have to have decided that following these impulses is not good for me. Out of affection for yourself, out of consideration for yourself, you have developed some distance from your gut reactions, from your gut impulses. That's number one. Then you have to be motivated by universal compassion uh, for all beings. You have to have the bodhisattva motivation because otherwise you really don't have a reason to put the pressure on yourself that you do when you undertake Tantra. I remember Tara Tukul used to laugh, one of my greatest teachers, he used to laugh about Westerners who they just jump to get a tantric initiation. Like, oh yeah, I want that one. <laughs> I want to get that wang or this wang. You know what they they call by using translating from Tibetan they call empowerment, which is actually not a really good translation. That kind of initiation and or consecration. And uh, but they don't really. And then Bodhisattva vowed. They sort of think, well, that's cool. But they're not a little worried about that. I'm going to save all beings. Well, I don't really know if I can do that sort of thing. But then, monks vow, oh no, oh terrible, oh that would be awful. Oh, I couldn't do that. Oh, I couldn't give up my beer. I couldn't give up my whatever, celibacy. I couldn't give up my property and have a vow of poverty and all that. So, so that would be really difficult. Meanwhile, that's really easy <laughs> to be a renunciant and not have to worry about, you know, uh, property and family and paying tuition, you know, to in the over expensive colleges for children and having children. And, and not to worry about all that is actually easy. The tantric vows of not letting your impulses control you and yet being aware of those deeper energies in your system, that's really difficult, really difficult. It's like dealing with your unconscious, you know, you're, putting, you're pushing your vow into the area of the unconscious where even your unconscious impulses are breaking your vow. Not to mention the physiological yogas involved in Tantra. So he used to laugh about, it. oh yeah, they really think that's hard, but they, they think this uh, Tantric thing is really easy, which is wrong. So, so that's the thing. So therefore, in Lamrim, now we're doing Lamrim, you begin, let's meditate together now. The way you begin Lamrim is you create the field within which you practice the stages of the path. Oh yeah, well finally, before introducing, before we meditate, let me just say last thing. In the order of the Dalai Lamas, of the, of the Dzongkhapa and so forth, the, the new Kadampa order, as it's called originally, or the Ganden order, the, the order of the joyous Tushita, or the Gelukpa order, which means the virtuous ones, was their later name for it, beginning in the 15th century, which was just a continuation of the order coming from Atisha in the 11th century, but Andromedamba. But in that, you know, the thing that people do when they do tantric retreat, where before that there's a preliminary, and one of the preliminaries is 100,000 bows, then there's 100,000 mandala offerings, then there's 100,000 Guru Pujas, and there's these hundred thousands of things that takes people sometimes years to do. Well, in the, understanding the Lamrim is considered the equivalent of that for an intelligent person. So it's physically easier, <laughs> but mentally not, but physically easier in a way. But uh, that just shows how profound and how extraordinary they feel that it is, okay? So, okay, now let's meditate on the refuge field, as it's called where first thing you do to get into that refuge field is you uh, look into yourself, at least the way I like to teach it. You're sitting meditating, you get ready to sit and meditate, and the first thing you do is you look into yourself, as if you could sort of get outside of your face and look back into your face. And then looking into your face, you sort of look through your face, to your brain, to your nervous system, to your heart chakra, your emotion center, whatever, and you look to find your identity, your fixed, your real identity, your real self. Okay? And when you turn on yourself to look for yourself, 
if you're honest with yourself, you don't really find anything. You don't find yourself sitting on your breastbone. You don't find yourself as a tattoo on your sort of one of the ventri uh, one of the chambers of the heart. You don't find it stamped in the pituitary gland or in the some particular neuronal pattern in your brain where there's just flows of energy going around. And so you, you will get a little dizzy when you turn to look for yourself, for your sense of self. And then in this case, you let yourself melt away, so to speak. You rehearse dissolving yourself. When you don't find a real self, a fixed thing that is sort of reflects back to you, oh, this is me, you don't find that, but you, you feel it should be there, but you don't find it. When that happens, you feel dizzy when you do it with concentration. And in this case, instead of like being freaked by the dizziness and coming back to asserting control, looking at something, you let yourself melt down. You, you, you decide to, in your mind, whether through a verbal articulation or just when you get used to it, just a kind of a letting go process, you decide that you're not certain what you are. You sort of disappear under your own analysis. And you become, therefore, open potential. There's still a sense of presence that you have, but it's sort of open of any sort of mask, persona, mask. You know, persona means mask, by the way. Your identity, your, your real self, OK? And along when your sort of sense of what you really are dissolves under that analysis, your sense of what's around you dissolves as well. For example, I imagine myself as Bob Thurman uh, today on a Sunday night doesn't divorce me from being anticipating being myself when I'm doing some work tomorrow or when I'm concentrating on something or when I stumble and twist an ankle or whatever might happen to me, I don't radically speciate myself into being something other than those fortunate ones who are already there in the cars or who are already there in the whatever it is. So you let yourself and your world picture, your maintained world picture, just dissolve under analysis, under this brief self-investigation. And then what you do is your mind is open. You do, when you dissolve an analysis, it doesn't mean you become nothing. It means that you didn't find yourself as a fixed thing the way you thought you were there. So then what you do is you arise then in your ideal balanced embodiment with the field of vision in front of you, perhaps, which is usual for two-eyed beings who are always going in one direction. And uh, so body and mind, you sort of say, well, boy, that's a relief. I, um, my body wasn't infinity and my mind wasn't trapped in some sort of inner thing. My body and mind are the bo connected to body and mind of Buddha, Buddhahood. And uh, we actually want to help spread that more to make it more known in some other parts of the world. So then you, then you arise in your ideal meditative form and you sort of sit up and you sort of feel like I'm perfectly balanced, I'm perfectly calm, I'm perfectly good. And uh, you know, imitating what we did when we were in the, 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 um, uh, other form of Buddha, you think of yourself as perfectly balanced, perfectly alert, perfect, yet perfectly calm. And then you imagine above you in the sky, you forget about some ceiling over you if you're indoors, and you imagine in the sky above you the most amazing enlightened being you can think of. In my case, it might be Manjushri, or His Holiness the Dalai Lama, or historically it could be Shakyamuni Buddha, or all of the above, and Vimalakirti, something. 
And you imagine they are there, Samantabandra Bodhisattva, Manjushri Bodhisattva, Saraswati, the goddess of art and wisdom. And you imagine that they are there and they are seeing our eyeball. And the light is flooding down from them to us, filling us up with a bright light, soothing light, energizing light, beautiful light. And then in addition to that, around us are all beings Then imagine around you are all beings, so that when that light comes to you and you start shining and feeling energized by it, this reflects itself, it overflows and reflects to all the beings around you. And make sure that among all the beings are your loved ones, neutral ones, and enemies, rivals, beings that you think of as highly unpleasant. They're all there in subtle body form and you're trying to cultivate your equanimity, your equality, your perception of them as equal to each other and to you. So that's the beginning of setting of Lamrim. And it is said that when you meditate these three principles of the path in that setting, that you will make much bigger progress. Your progress will be incredibly empowered by the presence of this ancient teacher. Okay, ding. So that's begin. So now we begin the first thing. Now this brings up another really important point, and that is business of former and future life. I presume how many of you how how many of you here think that you have had a previous life, and therefore expect to have a future one? How many? Uh, about eighty percent. How many of you think you won't have that? You'll just be not, you'll cease to exist at death. How many of you think that? <laughs> and, uh, and I'm going to discuss this at length. You can get, you can be prepared. And because um, it's very, very important. Okay, now the text that I'm using is this Primitive Principles of the Path, which is considered, it was considered that, well, Tsongkhapa wrote it in a letter to somebody as the kind of a quintessence of the stages of the path type of practice. And, um, and it is said, also said to have been sort of like the quintessence of that, revealed to Tsongkhapa uh, by Manjushri on the roof, roof of the central temple in Lhasa. Okay, so, and the key verse here for the first principle is, um, well, it says, listen with clear minds, you lucky people who aspire to the path that pleases Buddhas. Strive to give meaning to liberty and opportunity and are not addicted to the pleasures of cyclic living. Cyclic living or cyclic living means living just sort of from birth to death, just going ahead with whatever your impulses tell you to go ahead with and therefore not actually taking the human life moment as an important evolutionary opportunity. And, uh, and then he gives this key verse. Uh, he says, lust for existence chains all bodied beings. Addiction to cyclic pleasures is only cured by transcendent renunciation. So first of all, seek transcendence. And then here's the thing of the practice. Liberty and opportunity are hard to get, and there is no time to life. Keep thinking on this, and you will turn off your interest in this life. Contemplate the inexorability of evolutionary effects, and the sufferings of life over and over again, and you will turn off interest in future lives. 
By constant meditation, your mind will not entertain a moment's wish, even for the successes of this life, and you will aim for freedom day and night, and then you have experienced transcendent renunciation. So those are the three verses. And, uh, of course, if you, if you don't think you have a future life, then you will not be able to turn off your interest in this life, as I translated Nang she dok. It's a, you know, se di nang she dok. Dok means to reverse. Nang she means interested viewing. So interest. You know, what we think of as interest, attention, you know, focus upon. And it's se di, this lifetime. So liberty and opportunity is, or in addition to the human life with liberty and opportunity is the thing that's particularly valuable and rare. You can have a human life that has no liberty because they're in uh, some sort of slave society or they're in a tribal thing where they just think they have to do whatever the prescription of doing whatever their parents did, uh, you know, where they don't have an idea of, of uh, some sort of personal individual development, opportunity of a human life. They just want to fit in with the culture in a monistic sort of way. That's not having any, uh, any leisure and any opportunity. So the leisure is, li or the liberty is, the liberty or leisure is, is leisure or liberty from being driven in such a way that there's nothing, you, you have no choice about how you spend your life. And then opportunity is a tenfold thing. It's specified in a tenfold thing uh, where um, it includes the main point being you're in a planet, you're in a culture where there has been a teaching of the evolutionary path to enlightenment, uh, to Buddha enlightenment. There is a real idea about that, and it is an incredible human possibility and human potential. So, <clears throat> so there's said to be ten opportunities and eight liberties. And, uh, oh yeah, I should say, also, the, this uh, Lamrim stuff is unpacked in the three-volume set uh, edited by Joshua Cutler, published originally by Snow Lion Press, and now probably republished by Shambhala Publications, since Snow Lion merged, merged with Shambhala Publications. In case you want to see more detail, you can look at that. And they're quite elaborate, they, the way they analyze where different human cultures have reached. Although they don't really plug in the uh, uh, sort of um, desert things the way I would like to do, necessarily. Anyway, and so, so that this is a really valuable thing, and that there is some point to not just live for the purpose of this life, as, as it is said, takes a little thinking about for us. Even if we believe that we had a future, a previous life, and we have a kind of conviction or faith or ideology that says, yes, we're going to have a future life, which is a very great step for us in this culture. It may be that we are not fully viscerally feeling that. You know, like we're thinking, thinking of it as a religious thing, having a form of future life, like a soul destiny. And we're like the people in the churches who whose sense of reality is formed in their science classes, and they think of religion as a kind of palliative thing where they can go and make themselves feel better, but it's not really realistic. The realistic thing is what they hear in the science classes from science or from science writers. And scientists assure people in this culture that there is no future life for consciousness. That, that's kind of an assurance. You can look to Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Steven Pinker, Carl Sagan, of course, in his day, you can look to any of these popularizers or authorities in scientific academia, and they will assure you that you cannot have a future life, which means not that you have to agree with them necessarily consciously, but it, 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 because we've been brought up like that, we still are kind of only living for this life because we don't have a consensual feeling like a matter-of-fact feeling about forming future life. We think it's kind of a woo-woo thing. Oh, maybe, oh wow, maybe I can be Cleopatra in the future life. <laughs> or the president, or whatever it is. It's like a woo-woo thing, rather than a normal thing. And not only a normal thing, but inescapable thing, actually. Completely inescapable. So we don't think of it that way. But we think of some realistic thing, like matter, or like cancer, or like, 
you know, Alzheimer's or our neurons are being depleted or whatever it is, or eating the wrong diet. We think of that, really, that's realistic because that's dealing with the material things that we're confronted with now, you know. So we think it's realistic to be concerned with the purpose of this life, in short. And unrealistic to be concerned with what might happen to us in a future life. So this is completely wrong from the Buddhist point of view, and I have something to say about it. Lately, that it took me years of dealing with it, it was so powerful in my own consensual thing. I think I told you all the story, didn't I, about where my teacher, my original teacher, caught me meditating one night, late at night, after I was already a Buddhist monk. I told you, you know that story. Everyone knows that story? No, some people don't? Well, okay, well, what, well then those who've heard it before will have to bear with me. I was meditating late, and I had to sneak around in that particular monastery in New Jersey, because that teacher had an uncanny ability to interrupt me when I was meditating. It was his, like, main thing he would hold to. And, so I was four o'clock in the morning, like fresh back from having been living with the Dalai Lama in India, in my monk's robes, my shaved head. I was sitting there meditating with a candle in the temple or building that we had built before I had gone to India. Hi, how are you, Christy? And uh, he came in and snapped on the light. What are you doing? I said, what do you mean, what am I doing? I'm meditating. Why are you meditating? Well, what do you mean, why am I meditating? I'm a Buddhist monk, I want to become enlightened. He said, Oh, he said, you can't get enlightened, you're an American. And I said, what do you mean? I'm, I believe in former and future life, I'm a, I'm a yogi, blah, blah, blah. And he kept after me. And I realized he was absolutely right. And probably because of that, it's only in the last few years that I've come to realize something about this false sense of materialistic realism, false realism of materialism, which is when you debate someone like, and I have debated people like Steven Pinker and others, uh, you know, you debate them and say, well, how about your future life? We're going to have one, right? Then they say, well, what evidence do you have for that? They're, they're very scientific, like, well, what's your evidence? So then you say, evidence is people remembering previous lives, and uh, the idea also, secondarily, like the thermodynamics, you know, the law of the conservation of energy, mind flow is an energy, why should that be the one energy that doesn't continue always when you have the conservation of energy as a, as a physical law? And mind, as a very subtle, albeit very subtle, is a kind of energy, how can you pick that out and say that one doesn't exist? So I used to do like that, and then they would just wag their head, oh, you know, poor, crazy, old-fashioned, superstitious person and a heretic of the consensual reality of our culture, which is that the, what, what's matter, what's material, is what matters. And that other stuff doesn't matter. It might be nice, might make you feel good, but it doesn't matter. Okay? So, so then you just don't get around to asking them, what is your evidence that you won't exist? Excuse me. But what evidence do you have that you're going to cease to exist just by dying? What's your evidence? And then, what are they going to say? Actually, they'll kind of say, yeah, well, we know that. They'll say that. But then you say, how do you know that? Did Carl Sagan report that he doesn't exist after he died? He came back and he said, I don't exist. He got on TV. I don't exist. You're cool. You can die and you just won't be here. Obviously not, because he, if he doesn't exist. <laughs> he could conceivably report it like, oh, I made a big mistake. I'm existing. I'm a groundhog outside of where I used to have tenure at Cornell on the lawn there. I'm now reborn as a groundhog on the grounds of, Ithaca, of, of Cornell University in Ithaca. He, if he could talk as a groundhog, he might report that. That's conceivable. But you can't report from nothing that you're nothing. You can't discover nothing. No scientist has ever discovered the nothing that anybody went into after dying. It, in fact, cannot be discovered, and not only is there no evidence for it, in principle, by simple common sense, there never will be evidence for it, ever. It's, in principle, unevidenced, which means that believing in it is, in fact, blind faith, without evidence and without any reason. So they have to at least own that up. They're supposed to be scientific, rational, and here they're holding an irrational belief, doggedly, as if it were a discovery. 
which is kind of psychotic, actually. It's crazy. It's, they're, they're hanging on to, I, as I, you know, I was talking to someone earlier in the day, if it's more reasonable to think that God created everything and he's in control and it's, he's a he and he speaks Hebrew and he occasionally appears on Mount Sinai as a burning bush and he tells Moses to go mess up Pharaoh. And because, why is that more reasonable? Because in, in fact, if there was such a being, they might reveal themselves to somebody. They might be there. They might say something. We could then question when they say, I, I own and control everything, because it might seem like they weren't doing a very good job about it, and they weren't really that powerful. But that you could actually see a being that we normally think doesn't exist, it, it's possible, because at least it's something. It's claimed to be something. Whereas the claim that there's a nothing there is an insane person's claim. It's like a paranoid, oh, there's something chasing me, oh, the FBI is like planting something in my brain. It's just nuts. There's no evidence for it whatsoever, is the point. So if you want to believe that you won't have a future life, go right ahead. If you are aware that it's a blind faith and dogmatic belief, and there's nothing to prove it to you, and there never will be. If you want to accept it like that, fine. Then you can't really feel that you're more highfalutin than those people in Texas, you know? who mess up and put creationism in the textbooks, you know? Because you're putting something completely irrational in your textbook with no evidence and no ever, ever evidence, okay? So that's a really important point. That then leads you, actually, if you're a rational person, into, at minimally, Pascal's wager in regard to former and future life. His wager was about belief in God, but you're not believing, no one's asking you to believe in an omnipotent creator being, deity. On the contrary, they, they say that they talk to the creator deity who was knocked up to, who was, a, you know, like a, supposed to be the creator deity. And he said he didn't create it in the Buddhist text. He said, I didn't actually do it. And I don't know how it works. I'm just a big, powerful guy here, but I don't really know what's going on. He said, Brahma. All right. So Pascal's wager in our case is, if you're not going to exist, which you have no reason to believe is going to be the case, and it violates all that you've ever perceived in nature, which everywhere is continuity. There can be quantum leaps within continuity, but it's continuity. But nevertheless, if you do believe in that, then if you act as if you're going to have to be there, in some form, your consciousness is going to continue, and you should actually make sure it continues in a good way, because it is going to. And if you're wrong, and you're just simply nothing, you're obviously not going to regret that you prepared yourself in case you're something. Whereas if you're going to be something, and you act recklessly in life on the basis that whatever you do will not have a consequence after death, then you will deeply regret that you're not prepared for that continuity. That's the version of Pascal's wager, right? Right, any question about that? The brave lady who doesn't think <laughs> it's going to exist? She's just putting me on, I think, really. She wouldn't even be here if she wasn't worried about it. Yes? Not so much a question, but a comment. But oh, wait, well, why not? I only asked for a question. Uh, uh. Asking about the correlation, possible correlation between near-death experiences and like the bar of food, where very often the same sequence of events. Oh, I always forget this. Sorry. Uh, the question was, um, what do you think about the possible correlation between near-death experiences, you know, Put reports it as a of near-death experiences, very clever. and uh, and the bardo Thodo? you know, where at least for the beginning of the passageway through the bardo. They seem to match up, you know, where we have yes, yes. a lot of these cases. Near death experience light, is very. Reading the near death experience literature is very useful yeah. for deepening one's concern about what will happen to one after death. You're absolutely right. Although the actual between state, the bardo, is much more drastic than the near death experience thing because you actually have died. <laughs> and that means that your subtle con consciousness continuum according to the way the Buddhist, Indian and Tibetan Buddhists describe the mechanism of, the re of rebirth, uh, has actually left this, uh, the physical body. 
So it can't sort of come back into the physical body. And in the between state, actually, one of the things that it tries to do is it wants to come into the physical body. And then it gets very frustrated when it can't do that. So, um, uh, so, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good comment slash question, absolutely. And it's very good to build that near-death near experience, memories of previous lives that people have, that literature is very valuable. Jataka tales, uh, which are not only in the Jatakas, but also in what are called the Avadanas, and even in some sutras, where the Buddha or other enlightened persons talk about what they remember from previous lives, and, what, and they analyze things that happen in this life in terms of the interactions of the same people in previous lives. My favorite of which among them is the one where there was a monk who was annoying everybody um, in the monastery because he would, get, he would sort of get all wound up and, give, and scold people. And, uh, and they, they said, you know, he just brays like an ass, and what can we do? How can we get him to stop? And so then the Buddha said, well, you have to realize that he did this in a previous life, <laughs> and he bothered you guys in the same way. And then he said, there was a thief. In, in another life, there was a thief who used to steal the harvest of some villages. And he had a donkey, and he had a lion skin that he had gotten in a bazaar somewhere. And he would put the lion skin on the donkey and send the donkey into the fields when the harvest was ready to be harvested by the villagers. And the villagers would think there was a lion in the fields, and they would run away. And then he would collect the harvest, load up the donkey, pack up the lion skin, and take off and sell it in the market. That was his MO. And then one day, he was doing that, and then the donkey saw a female donkey in the village and started braying madly. And the villagers, who were starting to run away because of the lion, they said, wait a minute, lions roar, they don't bray. <laughs> <laughs> so they ran back and they ripped the lion skin off the donkey and they saw it was a donkey. And then they saw the thief crouching there waiting to grab and steal their harvest. And so they beat him to death. And, and they made the donkey work in the town as among their, to do work for them. And now you monks who are, one of you monks, the lead monk who was complaining, you are the thief in the previous life. And the guy you're complaining about is the donkey in the previous life. So then Buddha solved their problem. He got them to be less self-righteous about the guy who was braying. And he got the guy to not bray <laughs> at the other monks. So Buddha had a pretty good sense of humor, I think, really. <laughs> He did find that previous life, one of my favorite stories. So anyway, I'm just saying that it's really important. So the first thing to meditate on is leisure and opportunity. And this is very important for compassion, for the bodhisattva mind, and for the intensity. So of course it's important for renunciation, and it's important for the intensity to really gain wisdom, insight. So it's foundational to the whole path. This, your own, you know, your own, your own estimation of your own value. You have to realize, if you have adopted the consensual theory in this backward and slightly psychotic culture that we live in, and we have been educated in, and we have been raised in, if you are stuck still in that, then you do not consider yourself to be anything of value. And actually, if you think your consciousness will cease when your brain stops, what you mean, what you're really saying to yourself is that your consciousness is not here now. There's an illusion that the brain creates that you have, you're here, but your consciousness is already nothing. So you just don't exist, actually. And when you get depressed, therefore, you're ready to shoot yourself right away because you can return to your actual state, which is a state of nothingness. So if you go around subconsciously and subliminally thinking that you're nothingness, you're not going to have a happy life at all. And you have to go in and find that in your mind. That is why we're brainwashed like that. We are, we are from a backward Western, Asia, Western Eurasian culture, we Western people, from a backward Western Eurasian, and even now if you're an Eastern person, but brought up in the Western sort of supposed great, brilliant educational system, materialist-dominated system, and, uh, and you are basically conditioned to be a slave consumer and a slave producer in an industrial society, like Charlie Chaplin, you know, who's a cog in a wheel, and, that's, and, you don't, and you're, you're meant to tolerate that situation because you're not very valuable. You're just a piece of, you're a bag of 
chemicals in a cheap chemicals in a bag of water, running around thinking you exist when you don't really, and trying to like do something to make yourself think you exist because you inside think you don't really exist. And it's all really nothing, actually. Which is totally, totally predicated. It's just, it's no better than the Inquisition that the scientists thought they had so brilliantly escaped from that told you you're kind of worthless sinner and you're only useful if you believe in them and then they'll open the door for you to go and sing in God's choir and you'll never be God yourself. And any mystic who thinks they are one with God then they're more or less going to burn them at the stake as being mislaid. Even poor Teresa of Avila who had visions of union with Jesus had to flagellate herself all the time between visions. And down the street from where she was telling her father confessor that she'd had this oneness with Jesus feeling were people being burned at the stake in the auto da fe of the, Chinese, of the Spanish Inquisition. And so they think they're greatly liberated, these scientific-minded materialists, but they're actually just as self-deprecatory as the old people under the church, that you're a worthless sinner, actually. But you're just plain worthless. You're not a sinner. <laughs> Because it doesn't matter whether you sin, because you're nothing. I'm sorry, but that, I'm sorry to condemn it, but it is the case. That is the bottom line in our culture. I'm, I'm very much sorry. That is why. And do you wonder why we happen to be destroying our planet, destroying all the other animals on it, and we have machinery that could destroy in a war in a short period of time, which we hand over to some psychological defectives through elections? or become, they become dictators through politics, another kind of politics. Is that intelligent, do you think? We're an intelligent culture? Everyone is all freaked out by Donald Trump. But as a brilliant article by Matt Taibbi said, Donald Trump is only saying what the Republicans have been saying since Nixon, at least, but at the dog whistle level, you know, about race and about this and that, you know. He's only saying it out loud, <laughs> and everyone's all freaked out. But he's saying this, they're all like that. Okay, sorry, I know. This is Lemrim. <laughs> but this is the basis. You're not going to get anywhere with all these things if you, if you think you're nothing. Because if you're nothing, and you have these impulses, and you have impulse of gr greed and obsession, you have certain angers and certain things you will not tolerate, and you're like, we are righteous about, and then when you get depressed, you're ready to do yourself in at the, sh at, at the you know, put squeeze of a trigger or you know, bottle full of sleeping pills, then you're not going to really make the kind of inner effort required to understand any of this, in fact. Because you, don't, you, you feel you don't have, it's like that guy said to me, you can't get enlightened, you're, not, you're just an American. And, you, and what gets enlightened is your mind, and you Americans don't think you have one. That's what he said to me. And I was saying, no, I'm this and that. But he was right, absolutely right. Even though I was already being a Buddhist monk and going through the motions and really intense about it. But somewhere I was still convinced that the realistic thing was, it's just all biological robot. And then I'm trying basically to do something, you know, mind over matter that I, that I don't think I have the mind energy to do. Do you follow me? So, in a way, the meditation that he kept interrupting me from doing under that guise was a kind of disappearing meditation, which is all that most of the people in all these Dharma centers are trying to do. They're trying to disappear. They're trying to just stay asleep, get asleep, just go unconscious, period without having to die. But they want to just, they think Satori is going to be, whew, everything disappears and they disappear. What a relief. Nothing to worry about because it's all gone. They can put as many parking tickets on the window of my car outside the Zen Center as they like because I'm never coming back. That's really what they think they're doing because, that, because they think that's the reality is this no non-existence. That's what materialism boils down to. There is this, not this subtle... Mind energy that's more powerful, actually, than atom energy, than coarse flesh and blood and so on. Okay? So liberty and opportunity are hard to get. This human life that you have, that puts us here in this classroom today, and many other great classrooms, greater than this classrooms that you've been in, 
It's hard to find this. Not many people do get into thinking along these lines. So that, that's a very powerful theme to reflect. How valuable do I really think I am? How do I spend my time? Do I consider my time to be infinitely precious? As evolutionary, like what I put my attention on, is that something really important because of the type of attention that I have? Or do I some, just sort of veg out, you know, like watch the commercials or whatever, you know? What do I do? Okay. And second theme, there's no time in life. So once you really get to feel you're valuable by meditating this, the next thing you really have to think about is that you're going to die. And then at first you say, well, I know I'm going to die. Everybody knows that. But then you, if you look again, you examine yourself. All of these meditations involve critical thinking. And you examine yourself, you're like, oh, yeah, I'll be here next week. I'm going to come back tomorrow. I'm going to do that. Next year after I retire, I'm going to do the other thing. We act like we're immortal, actually. And we have, again, in our culture, you know, you know, Joe Schmo is sitting there, and the, the doctor has, like, terminal. They brought in the body bag in the closet. The nurses are ready at any moment. They're not bothering with whatever it is. The guy's gone, but they come in and say, OK, I'll, be, I'll come back next week. I'll bring you your favorite apple pie. They're taught to do that. Although it's beginning to change now with the hospice thing and so on and the expense of staying in the hospital. But when I was small, that's what you did. It would be rude to say to the most terminal person, okay, bye, this is, I guess, the last hurrah. I won't be seeing you since you're going. You're traveling, right? You don't do that. Again, to hide it from that person. So they think they'll be there because that's what we think. So we live in denial that we're going to die. If you really think about, I am going to die, then it makes your presence much more precious. And furthermore, I don't know when it will be. You know, then they, you meditate on the young one sometimes dies before the old one. The health, sick one, the healthy one sometimes dies before the one they think is sick. The one in a safe place sometimes dies by an accident than the one who's on the front line somewhere. There's no security as to when it could happen anytime. Won't happen here at Tibet House, though. <laughs> For sure. Don't worry. Not today. But it could happen. I mean, they could, you know, Putin could nuke New York. Or they could do, or the, or the Taliban could get a dirty bomb out of Pakistan. They don't have to wait for Iran. There's plenty in Pakistan. Plutonium. So there's no time to life. So that means every moment could be your last. So then you really, like, you, you get that will key you up a lot. And you get those two themes together, how precious your human embodiment and Tao liberty opportunity, how you achieved it through your own evolutionary experience from previous lives, you personally, and it's really valuable to you, and you're going to lose it, and you don't know when. And when you do, it's, where, it's whatever exists in your being at the subtlest level. It's your spiritual gene. It's a really good concept, I think, to think of. That which imprints your deeds of generosity, morality, tolerance, creativity, in, you know, concentration, wisdom, you know, etc., artfulness, determination, wisdom. So that way you do. Then you might get into, well, I want to be in a better class, I want to have a better IQ next life, I want to be with better parents, I want to be this, that, I want to be in a better realm, better world, better society. Then you get the, you you might once you turn off interest in this life, then you get interest going in the next life. But then this mo this deeper thing, you want to turn that off too, because even if you have a little better circumstance, it's not going to still satisfy you as far as understanding yourself, and understanding the world. So you're not going to necessarily become enlightened and even in that better life. And so therefore, you reflect on the inexorability of evolutionary effects, which means how difficult it is to become more positive, how hard it is. The, the impetus and the habit energy of negative mind states and negative habits of action is so powerful. To do something really different and turn that tide and do something really positive, really transcendent, is difficult. So therefore, the momentum is to drag yourself down. And then you look in terms of the tenfold path of skillful and unskillful evolutionary action, which I don't have, I'm not going to take time to elaborate because I'm going to run out of time in this effort today. I'm just sort of giving an overview of it all. And then, then the idea that no situation in life, even in the heaven, 
will really bring me happiness if I don't understand myself. Because as long as I think I'm the one in this distorted way, as in the Four Noble Truths, you know, that sort of self-absolutize myself, then I'll always be in an in a upper creek because the universe will be bigger than me. So by thinking over those two things, that life, the egocentric life I really should have written here, and the sufferings of life, so contemplate the inexorability of evolutionary effects and the sufferings of life over and over again, and you will turn off interest in future lives. So that's really good. Then you, you're, it's not that you, it's just, you know, turning off interest doesn't mean you wouldn't try to live a good life this life, and you wouldn't even like to be born in a better neighborhood next life. It doesn't mean that. You would, and you can work at that. It's just that it puts the priority lower. The priority of every moment is to find your true nature, to find out who you are and what you are, to develop the wisdom that Buddha has faith in you that you have, even though you don't have that faith. You don't think that something you understand will actually change you dramatically and bring you true happiness. We don't think that, or we would really be trying to gain that understanding. If we really, like connoisseurs, you know, if we really knew that was the most delicious dish, we would really be focused on that. We would not be down at the, at the steakhouse or the vegan delicious new restaurant or whatever it is. We would not, that we would still go there maybe, either one, but, but would, that would be a lower priority. Our real priority would be the most delicious thing, which is to know what you are. To realize that you're not there as an absolute thing apart from other things. You're like in the flow of interconnectedness with the beings. When you know that, apparently, I still myself, I'm not quite, well, I can, I can vouch for some direction in that way. You cheers you up a lot. You have to get cheered up when you're all interconnected with everything. <laughs> because it's a desperate situation. <laughs> you know, the true desperation of being interconnected with this mess. So that cheers you up. Because other people have it even worse. They don't even know that. They're sitting there originally thinking that there's something different than what's around them. And they're trying to just hold on to that difference. And of course, that's futile and hopeless, unnecessary stress. So at least you kind of relax and you're part of the, one of the campers in the motley, one of the members of the motley crew. And is that the name of a rock group too? Anyway, it's the name of us. So by constant meditation on the not interested in this life, not interested in future life, which means lowering the priority levels of them, your mind will not entertain a moment's wish even for the successes of this life. So you're not, and, and, and again, wish is, you know, it means really that, that's what I really want is to be this and that, you know. You won't get carried away like that. And you will aim for freedom day and night. You realize that's the true bliss. Freedom itself is the true bliss. That's what you'll aim for. And then you experience transcendent renunciation. And when you do, you will be really happy. You really will. And that, but the, although that not nirvana, but that's just a foretaste of nirvana. But you, because you suddenly drop out of a lot of the things you have anxiety about. You have, where, uh, can I get another? Can I get a better place? Can I get a better house? Is my kid going to get into college? Is it, whatever it is that you get really clutched about, you won't get so clutched. And actually, it's like, can I win this hand of bridge or this hand of poker? And you actually, you'll be better and you can bluff better because you'll be more relaxed and more dropped down. <laughs> so you actually be able to play the game better. Because, you know, if you're okay, win or lose, you know, you, you won't be so, quite so gripped by these lesser, lesser objectives, is what I'm trying to say. And the minute you do that too, you begin, you, you eventually will, like, if you're a dense person like me, it'll take you 25 years <laughs> to realize that this transcendence or renunciation actually is where you really forgive yourself, you have compassion for yourself, you decide that you deserve to take a break about whether or not you are succeed in this or that, that your, your intrinsic being, your natural being, as a, I shouldn't say intrinsic, that's a bad no-no word, but your natural being is so precious that you, you are fine whether or not you can do, stand on your head for 30 minutes 
in your yoga class to show off to the teacher <laughs> or the students, whatever. Even if you can't, you're still very, very precious. See, because you change. And that gives you tremendous relief. And then, then, when you look around you, when you have compassion for yourself, and you're letting yourself off, and you're only putting yourself, putting all your grindstone focus, you know, on freedom, on enlightenment, on realizing the nature of reality, there you're still knotted up to get that, and that's all right. Don't pull some fake thing of a misunderstood Zen of thinking, oh, the thing is I shouldn't want to be enlightened, then I'll be enlightened. That's false. The desire for enlightenment is a good desire. It's where all the desires should be focused. The desire for freedom and enlightenment, absolutely. That's where it counteracts the desire that grips you. That's a desire that you only can control yourself and aim it. It will not match because it doesn't come naturally. Actually, the way we're habituated. You know? so, so then the minute you feel that way, you look at other people, you see their furrowed brows, you see the tensions in their face, you see how they're like charging ahead to get that next thing, you know, in that unidirectional way. And then you realize that mostly what they, that next thing will not be satisfying to them. You can see that. So you, you begin to feel automatically compassion for them. Until you've had that compassion for yourself through transcendent renunciation, of some degree of transcendence, you will not have a genuine, you will not be able to be compassionate for them. You, or you will have the form of compassion, but it will be, oh, I, oh, I wish they had what they wanted, which isn't really what, is what they need. You know, like, you know, then you think it'd be compassionate, oh, I wish they had more food, I wish they had a car, I wish they had this and that. It's not necessarily what they really need. And not that it's not, it's not bad to give them food and a car and whatever, but then they might run the car into a tree, you know, then they might become obese and you have to go to the hospital, have, to have, have insulin injections, whatever. So, but the, okay, so that's the first principle of the path in this lamrim, okay, that we're talking about. So second, once you have that, you do feel compassion for others. But then he says here, transcendence without the spirit of enlightenment. That's the bodhicitta, spirit of enlightenment. Cannot generate the supreme bliss. People wrongly translate it sometimes as the thought of enlightenment. But it's not just a thought. It's a deep determination in the deep heart, deepest part of the mind. And so it's not even a mind in the sense that it is a mind, but it's not a mind in the sense of sort of a, a mental idea. It starts as a mental idea, but then it turns into a true spirit that sort of becomes your spirit. The spirit of enlightenment, as it's called, of love and compassion for all beings, universal love and compassion. So one, without the spirit of love, it cannot generate the supreme bliss of unexcelled enlightenment. Therefore, the Bodhisattva conceives the supreme spirit of enlightenment. And then they have a verse, a beautiful verse, about how you have to feel sorry for the beings carried away on the currents of four mighty streams. Those mighty streams are the stream of the lust for existence, the stream of the lust for non-existence, and two others which I forgot what they are. I think there's habitual ignorance, maybe an instinct for ignorance, but I, I'm not certain about the, the, the last two, but don't worry about it. But it's useful if you do know them, but I, can, I can't remember them right now. Tightly bound by the near inescapable chains of evolutionary action, that's karma, Trapped and imprisoned in the iron cage of self-concern. That means just thinking about what I want, what I get, who I, you know, what I have. That's self-concern. What do I need? What, what do I get out of this? You know, always looking, bringing everything back to your own thing. It's an iron cage. Because you, when you're thinking that way, you never have enough of whatever it is. Totally enveloped in the dark of misknowledge. Born and born again and again in endless cyclic lives uninterruptedly tortured by the three sufferings. Uh, you know, the three sufferings, uh, birth, old age, that's usually four, birth, old age, sickness, and death is four. The three, oh yeah, I know the three are the suffering of suffering. That's the easy one. Then the suffering of change, which means what we think of as ordinary happiness. And then the suffering of creation, meaning that, which is only experienced by those who have achieved certain meditative states where there's no friction, frictional kind of suffering or banging into anything because they're in these vast states of 
love and compassion, the Brahma realms, the contemplative mansions or something like that. And there, then it, it's the knowledge, it's kind of a knowledge thing, because they don't feel bad, they feel good, but it's the knowledge that somehow this is only a temporary state, and that, that the life state, it, it had causes to reach that meditative state, and that therefore it will collapse eventually, and therefore they'll be back in this sort of everything where everything doesn't work quite well, and that's the suffering of creation, you know, which only a high meditating person gets to know, you know. Such is the state of all beings, all of them just your mothers, from your natural feelings conceive the highest spirit. Okay, so now more quickly, the second level of the Lamrim is developing the spirit of enlightenment, of universal love and compassion. And this is where you are born again. This is Buddhist born again 101, to be a born again Mahayana Buddhist. Because it is believed that if you conceive the spirit of enlightenment, of love and compassion, for all beings, and that becomes your dominant motive, and you replace self-concern with the other concern, with altruism, then you become a different being. It's like a huge evolutionary quantum leap in your, in your being. Because although you are human, and you have a greater degree of sensitivity and compassion toward other beings than other animal forms, nevertheless, you're still primarily, as an ordinary being, you're still primarily concerned for, the, for yourself. Not in the, it's not, it doesn't mean you're necessarily selfish. You might be very nice sometimes, but you're, when you're, even when you're not nice, you're thinking, what am I getting out of it? You're evaluating things by thinking, like, what's in it for me? Your main orientation, like what you think is normal to get up in the morning and think about the day and think, what am I going to get out of today? What am I going to do for myself today? Where am I sitting? How is this? Where's, where's my seat on this subway? And so on. In other words, you're always focused on the self and on your, what you want and need, and you're thinking about it. That's called self-preoccupation, self-cherishing, self-concern, and it's a prison of an iron cage. And so when you switch that, where you, it's not that you, again, it's a matter of prioritizing. You minimize the priority of that, and you maximize the priority of what other people need. They, what do they want? There's a lot more of them. That's a bigger energy of what they need. And that becomes your focus. You kind of get distracted, even, you could say, in the initial stages. You become distracted from what you want, even though you might be motivated to do it because it will benefit you. There's a fake thing that they make the psychologists nowadays, some of them, and they say there's no real altruism because people who are altruistic have an, an underlying motive to do that it will benefit themselves. And therefore, it's not true altruism. But that's, listen, it's good enough altruism when they're only focusing on what they can do for others. That's good enough. It's silly to worry about it, you know, that you're supposed to be, it's some kind of, you're supposed to be some kind of martyr or something to be truly altruistic. But not at all. Why shouldn't you have enlightened self-interest? in being born again is a really happy person because you're really thinking about others. Why shouldn't you? It's harder for men than women, of course. Women are more advanced evolutionarily in their ability to be cherishing others more easily than males. And therefore, that's why they're less violent. That's why they're more, hap more happy, actually. That's why they have more fun, in fact. All these like, sex people, they go around, oh, women, oh, they get all excited about it. <laughs> they do studies. It's not just because of whatever, it's because they are aware more easily that they're connected with other beings. They're less intense in their delusion of self-separateness. They still have it. Every female has a male element. Every male has a female element. But I'm just saying, it's, I love to say, actually, in our chauvinist culture, or any chauvinist culture, I was telling people, Muslims in Indonesia, <laughs> I gave a lecture to the Prime Minister of India about it, actually. And he was shocked. After I shook his hand and wished him well, I shook, I shook the hand and wished well, and asked the good name, as they say in India, of his female interpreter, with equal focus on purpose, a little bit. <laughs> Naughty of me. I made an extra fuss about it. Okay, so now best to meditate on this one. Let's do a quick meditation on this. Okay, and notice how it fits with the whole multiple life theme, which is why I always say don't bother to practice Buddhism. I mean, you can do whatever you want, but don't 
don't make, don't make a big effort about it unless you have really tangled with this issue and really kind of come to see that you can't really get out of being here and this will go on life after life. So you're here for the duration. You know, that's the preciousness of your human life and that with liberty and opportunity. That's what gives you the energy and the motive to really try to transform yourself, to live evolutionarily, to try to be an evolver yourself, in a conscious evolver, because you are an evolver. And it isn't just your genes that you're going to dump them off someplace and then they're going to run off and do something. You personally are going to be involved. So you're going to have the consequence of everything you think and do now, infinitely. That puts infinite pressure on you to think and do and say something just a tiny bit better. Even a tiny bit becomes of infinite importance. Right? It's clear. So similarly, meditate now. You've had infinite previous lives. Okay? You, we can't remember them. Maybe some of you have remembered a few. But in theory, there can't be an uncaused cause, a first cause, that nothing that everybody keeps running around freaking out about cannot be a source of anything. Because it's nothing. It's not a place, a space, there's no substance, no energy. It's nothing. It's not there. So nothing can, only, no something can come from there. Something always comes from something else. So those dogmatic, uncaused cause, first cause, prime mover, all that kind of stuff is just whistling in the dark by philosophers and theologians. Even they don't, even theists don't even think that because they think God was there before the universe, you know. So they, they know it, and then God would be beginningless for them too. So they know about beginninglessness. It's too, it's too obvious. And I guess the materialists think nothing was always there. <laughs> so do you come from an infinite nothingness? <laughs> Point is, you've had infinite numbers of previous lives, and so has everybody else. And therefore, including every cockroach, every mosquito. And therefore, every single one of them has been your mother in some life. You, you've been theirs too. But that's, that's, not, that's not useful to dwell upon. To, what's useful to dwell upon is all you beings have been my mother. You have all therefore lived for me as your infant. You have cared for me when I was helpless and I was a pain and a pest. I was a little bag of mother's gold. And you kindly cared for me and you protected me and you brought me up life after life after life. So I should feel the same concern for you as I do for my old mother of this life. The naturally, at least. Some of us may not. We may have difficulties with our mothers. That can happen in industrial societies. But basically, the role is the most giving of self to another. And all beings have done that for me. That's the first step called mother recognition. And you can go on for weeks on that. And it's very, very powerful. If you do it within the refuge field, it's much faster than going back to remember your infantile memories on the psychiatrist's couch. You will very quickly be able to, because you have all those memories, actually. We all do. Second is to remember the kindness of the mother and to sort of reflect, if we can't yet remember how our own mother treated us and fed us and protected us, etc., when, when we were first born, when we were a helpless infant, we probably know someone who's had children, might have had children ourselves, and we realize how much work it is and how much effort we made and how much, therefore, effort our mother of this life made about us. And we feel the first part of gratitude is infinite, vast appreciation. And we fit that over where we have diffused our sense of kinship and familiarity, familiarity to about our mother of this life by recognizing the motherliness of all beings. And so when we do that, we begin to feel truly sentimental about all beings. We feel that we can sort of feel the loving gaze somewhere in every being, even the one who looks angrily at us because they don't, they're rivals or they don't like us. Somewhere in that being, there is that motherly gaze. And so we feel grateful for them that they were our mother. Then the second part of gratitude is we deeply wish to repay them. And we can repay them by trying to see that they are happy. 
And when we want to see how they are happy, we want to imagine them as being happy because that's not easy. And we come to the fourth step, where, which is called the step of lovely love, where we think of love meaning the wish for the happiness of the beloved. And when we think about the beings that we know and wish their happiness and try to imagine them as being happy, we, we see them internally in our mind's eye as beautiful. Therefore, it's called lovely love. And we really expand that feeling. And then in this, we come to the fifth stage, where, but right around this in the fourth and fifth stage, we add in this thing called the exchange of self-preoccupation for other preoccupation. And where we think that, oh, these mother beings, just like me, they will, I think I should be happy. I want to be happy, and I feel I have a right to be happy. They feel the same way. So the vast infinite ocean of those beings, they all just want to be happy. So I should think more about them being happy than worry about myself being happy. It's called the, this is called the equal exchange of self-preoccupation for other preoccupations. So I should be preoccupied with their needs and their wishes more than I am obsessed or shifting my obsession away from my own wish for my own happiness and my own pleasure and my own relief or whatever it is. And that's, the, that's where you start expanding this fourth step built on mother recognition, remembering of kindness, repayment of kindness, and lovely love. And then we move it, we move it to connect it with the exchange of self and other. And then we add to it compassion, which goes along with love, because love is imagining the beloved to be happy. But then it bumps into the reality of the beloved, and we begin to see how many things make the beloved unhappy, and we feel that becomes unbearable to us, and that's when we have compassion for them. Compassion is the opposite, in a way, or the, the other side of the coin of loving and wishing the, be, the beloved to be happy. Compassion is feeling compassion and wishing the beloved not to be unhappy, finding their unhappiness unbearable. So this becomes extremely intense, this fourth and fifth steps, bringing to the sixth step where we reflect about the Buddhas. And we say, well, Buddhas already went through this. They're already bodhisattvas. They already wish everyone to be happy. But they still, every, I'm still unhappy, and a lot of people seem to be unhappy to me. So it isn't that I'm just going to sit back and accuse the Buddha of abandoning some people. I could get into that, but that wouldn't help. So I'm going to take up the burden of those people that don't seem to yet be happy, even though Buddha is here in the world with them. And then this causes one to focus on one's self in this life and come up with the sixth step, which is called the step of universal responsibility. I will take responsibility for all beings. I will be... It's the, then, it, it, so that's, those six steps are called, combined with, of course, the exchange of self and other, are called the causal steps of this special high-tech precept coming from the, previous, the future Buddha, Maitreya, actually, through a medium about 2,000 years ago, and a little less, 1,900 years ago, 1,800 years ago. And uh, this then leads to one feeling, OK, I'm going to take universal responsibility. I'm going to make a vow that in all my future lives, I am going to do whatever it takes to make all beings free of suffering, to bring them all into the city of happiness. That's going to be my soul, my underlying, my overriding life's purpose from now on forever in the future. And then that's when, that, that's when one makes the Bodhisattva vow. But notice, that vow is like a, one thing, I call it the messianic resolution. It's kind of a messiah vow or a messiahess vow. It's a vow to be the savior of all beings. However, it's not considering the, the method of doing so, of course, at this point but it's vowing to do it. So it makes you too demented to do that if you have not already dislodged the conviction of our materialist upbringing that we don't have a future life, that we're only the body, we're only this body in this life. If you feel that way, you cannot really make such a resolution, I'm going to save all beings from suffering, because you don't have time 
to, you know, and you're just a person, you know, and, and you're going to die and then be nothing. So it's too unrealistic if you follow me. So therefore, don't try to take the Bodhisattva vow unless you have already come to see the empirical reality of the former and future life. That is the one required prerequisite. You know, these Zen Center people, sometimes it's like, sentient beings are numberless, I vow to save them all. This kind of thing they say. But they're not, they're then going along with the materialist view. They're sort of Zen scientific types. And they, they think that that's just an old superstition and they will criticize you for saying that. And this, this is not correct, we would say. The great Buddhist philosophers would say. Okay. So now, third, so that's the second thing. And once you get that, they say the, the messianic resolution, the sixth step, you should be feeling a little crazy because it's like, I've got to save everybody. You know, you, it makes you feel crazy. It, it means you're succeeding in it when you feel a little crazy. But where you then shift into the Bodhisattva vow is you say, well, in order to really save everybody, I have to become a perfect Buddha. Because as my, with my present understanding, my present skill, my present knowledge, I would not be able to save everybody, of course. So I have to become a Buddha to be able to do it. So then you sort of fit back into the, you get on the winning team, the Buddha team, and it calms you down a little bit. So then you feel calm and delighted when you, when you, when you then take the Bodhisattva vow, you feel delighted because you become a child of the Buddha. You enter the Buddha family. You're born, reborn again in the Buddha family. So, on the one hand, don't think of it. Don't even think about it if you haven't first thought about your relationship to your own future lives. Because if you're here intertwined with all your mother beings for infinite future lives, then you might as well be a Buddha. And it would be really better that they be Buddhas so that nobody will be harmful or in any way difficult for anybody else. Everybody will be already enlightened in a way. As in the case of Shiva, working with Avalokiteshvara. Okay, so now the third thing is, of course, even with that compassion, and even with transcendent renunciation, you cannot liberate beings, you cannot become enlightened. As Shantideva says, everything the Buddha taught was for the sake of teaching wisdom. And people, finally, it's only your own wisdom that will free you from suffering. Nobody else can do it for you. Compassion alone won't do it, and transcendence alone won't do it. They're essential to get going, but you yourself have to do it by understanding. And so the first thing you do in that is you start looking for yourself. You understand the Buddha's teaching that the problem we have is that we reify, we invest in things, we exaggerate about things by habitual instinct and sometimes by conscious theory that everything has an intrinsic reality that, you know, the leg of that camera has some intrinsic legness about it. It has a leg essence in it. It's, it has the leg thing in itself in it. The camera leg thing in itself in it. When we see it, it, it seems to be there as if it was objectively there without interacting with me or with the atoms or with the floor or anything. It's just the real leg. And so that's called objective selflessness the objective self that we presume to be in things, and then the subjective self that we presume to be in things is our own personality self. And when we feel that we're a fixed personality, that our real self-identity is, is a fixed absolute thing in us, we see others as if they are feeling that about themselves, and we think of them as some sort of absolute thing that they are. So, it, so it's most useful to look into oneself 
So if you meditate, you look for your... You, meditating on selflessness means you look for yourself. It doesn't mean you sit and repeat selflessness, selflessness, selflessness. That's worthless. That will make you nihilistic, if anything. What you do is you sit and you think about what you have... You, you analyze what you feel is yourself. And your motive there is to find it and to verify that it's there and to validate it against the challenge of the Buddhist scientist, the Buddhist psychologist, the Buddha himself who was a psychologist. You're disagreeing with him because we viscerally do disagree. We think we're here. If we're, if we're riding in first class or business class, we think that, you know, it's really great here, in fact. <laughs> and we really think it's absolutely excellent. So we overinvest in the intrinsic realities of persons and things. And the way of meditating on that is to admit to ourselves that we do. And when we admit to ourselves that we do, we then take up the challenge of the great Buddhist scientists like Buddha, Nagarjuna, Sangha, etc., all of them, Dharmakirti, Chandrakirti, down to Tongkhapa, the Dalai Lama, Pranasambhava, whoever it may be. And we, we say, okay, we don't, and we, we acknowledge that we viscerally don't think that everything is just relational and contextual, and we think there are some real things in, in things, and really real things. And so, we, but we take the challenge to verify that by finding them. So you look into yourself meditatively. Where is my real self? Where is it? Is it in the solar plexus? Is it in the brain? Is it in the throat? Where is it? And when we do that in a realistic way, we will very much come up against some preliminary stages of how we got to feeling, looking for ourselves. We'll think, well, I really became this, I really learned that. And we have to look to all of that, sift through all of our experience, that even the unconscious, eventually even the unconscious level as well as the conscious level. And then we're told that if we do that, we will come into a situation where we will not find any fixed self. When we come, when we come that, when we get there, then we will have an experience as if the self disappears. This was brilliantly explained, again, by Taratuko, where he said, our sense of our relative self has been so long smothered within our false construct of an absolute self, the iron cage of feeling I'm an absolute separate self, that when we see through the absolute self, it dissolves through our critical insight, that melting sense of, a sense of absolute self brings the sense of relative self along with it and both disappear. And we, therefore we mustn't get carried away by that kind of experience of disappearing and thinking that's enlightenment. Because it's just a, it's a penultimate step. Enlightenment is rather where we are beyond the duality of being here present or being absent. And there'll be a miracle in the Buddhist case. I mean, I mean there'll be a text in the, in the Buddha's case where we will repeat that kind of thing, you know. So when you meditate that, you will lose yourself. And most important, you mustn't think that you found this loss of yourself. You must realize that just the mere losing of it is the finding of it to the extent of generating a, a cross. And everything will disappear. I don't know what I'm saying. I always do this when I meditate this with a group. I totally, we all totally disappear. And if you're really advanced and hip, you'll feel, you'll feel frightened. Oh, I'm going to disappear. I won't know what I am. I'll become demented. Well, you can't. Not from this meditation. You might from food that you eat, bad food. <laughs> Monsanto treated food, you might. but not from this, because there's no nothingness for you to go into. It's not there. That's the way of controlling fear, 
is realizing that you can't ever be nothing. Your continuity and your positive human attitudes and your compassion and your transcendence and your critical insight and intellect that sees the royal reason of relativity will carry you through. And here there's some very valuable verses that I will read. Who sees the inexorable cause, causality of things, of both cyclic life and liberation, that's samsara and nirvana. Because there's a, there's a causality even of nirvana, meaning of the realization of it. Actually, nirvana is literally known as the uncaused, but in the process of realizing it has a cause. So therefore, there's a causality about samsara and nirvana, or cyclic life and liberation. But who sees, therefore, that, that it's inexorable, and destroys any objectivity conviction, that is, destroys any sense of conviction that there's an intrinsic objectivity or essence in anything, uh, that's a beginning step, thus finds the path that pleases victors. That means then Buddhas will like that when we do that. That's the path of, of recognizing even though there's no objectivity anywhere, intrinsic objectivity anywhere, there is inexorable causality of all relational things. The experience of nirvana even itself being a relational thing, although nirvana by definition is not a relational thing, but its experience is. And of course, samsara, we know that's a causal process. Then he says, appearance inevitably relative, Anything that you see, anything that you engage with is inevitably relative. And voidness is free from all assertions. And emptiness is inconceivable and it's beyond capturing by word or theory. Deep, deep nature of reality, in other words. As long as these are understood apart, the victor's intent is not yet known. So the non-duality of those two things, a sense of voidness as if it were some sort of place of freedom beyond all conception, and all kind of inevitably relative appearances, or experiences, or perceptions. As long as they are understood apart, in other words, dualistically, the victor's intent is not yet known. But when they coincide, not alternating, this is really important, this verse, mere sight of inevitable relativity secures your knowledge beyond objectivism. So that is really good. Like, I see the pillar. To me, that pillar seems to be objectively real. But the fact that I see it, and even that I see it in a way, seeming way, which I have, by thought experiment and by philosophical analysis, realized it cannot be objectively real. It's only a relational thing. So I'm seeing it in, through a kind of misknowing habit or misknowledge habit. But the fact that I'm even doing that and having a misknowledge about it means it is relational. It is, even though it's see, the seeming of it as if it were non-relational, is relational. So therefore, mere sight of inevitable relativity secures knowledge beyond objectivisms, and projecting an intrinsic objectivity in the thing. And investigation of the view is perfect, because it, the voidness of inconceivability, beyond free from all assertions, and the inevitable relative appearance are coinciding not alternating. And then he goes one step further, which is very, very important. That's sort of true non-duality, that one. But then he goes even further. He says, more, as experience dis dispels absolutism and voidness clears away nihilism, you know voidness dawn as cause and effect. And then you will never be deprived by extremist views. So this is the closest thing to really sealing the two non-duality things together. Because normally, you see, experience dispels nihilism, and voidness dispels absolutism. Because absolutism means you know, investing an absoluteness in the pillar, and then knowing that it's void, meaning it has no intrinsic pillar-ness in it, would be dispelling absolutism normally. Voidness would be the, the, the counteractor for for absolutism, and then the fact that things are relative would be the counter for nihilism, that a mistaking of the voidness as nothingness, if you follow me. But here he's reversing that, and he's saying that experience and, or appearance gets rid of absolutism. That is, even if I see something as absolute, I'm seeing it, even I'm making that mistake, it is relative. 
because I wouldn't see it, and I wouldn't be able to make the mistake if it was mistake if it was absolute. And similarly, voidness, having seen it disappear, but returned, and even that the, its disappeared state and its presence are coinciding and not alternating, because I'm seeing them like a reflection in a mirror, that clears away nihilism. Voidness clears away nihilism. It's so cool, really. And then to do that, if you get that, you don't have to go and read Lake Shinimbo all the time. You just see anything in front of you. You feel yourself, I'm really here. And you know your relative. So it's a, it's a double bind, it's a quadruple double bind that makes you able to meditate in the surface of your experience all the time, day and night, on emptiness. And because when you're seeing everything, the fact that you see it, hear it, think it, it means it's empty. You wouldn't be able to do it if it wasn't empty. Because it's empty of any separate existence, all of it, it's, you're constantly engaged with it. So that's where it's all coinciding. So you know voidness itself, dawn as cause and effect. Then you will never be deprived by extremist views. You can't fall back either into absolutism or nihilism. Those are, those are really profound and wonderful verses. Okay, so I've talked for an hour and 36 minutes, which leaves us a few minutes for questions. And uh, I am going to stop rigorously at 9 because I have to go at 5 a.m. to an airplane again in the morning just to add jet lag to jet lag, just for the fun of it, because I got delayed coming back from India, so I didn't have the days or something in between the next trip. I'm sorry, but I had a great, I had, an, I had a reason for being delayed, so it was all right. Yes, next week is Lake Sinimbo, don't worry, I'll be here. But go ahead. Uh, you were talking about cause and effect, and I'm reading this book, uh, the, a translation of uh, Naga, Nagarjuna's, what is it, Mula Madhyamaka Kirkata, is that, does it mean? Is there a book back then? Oh, <laughs> Nagarjuna's <laughs> book. <laughs> Actually, I have new hearing aids, so I'm really hearing you clearly, but I still can't tell what you're saying. Na the Nagarja, na uh, Nagarjuna's or Yuna's book called Mula. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. The, wait, no, the book is called Wisdom. Then its, it's, uh, it's subtitle is called The Root Verses of the Central Way, as I prefer, or Middle okay. Way. So, what about I, it? My question is: I don't know whether it's the translate uh, the uh, translator's error or uh, it is what it is. Uh, it talks about uh, that Nagarjuna doesn't believe in co uh, causes effects, but only on conditions. The, uh, the, 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 it talks that. That Nagarjuna says it does, uh, he doesn't believe in causes and effects, but he believes in conditions to come together. Uh, no, in the, he, he so totally believes in cause and effect. Okay. Nagarjuna's argument totally believes cause and effect, totally is based on the law of excluded middle, it's totally logical and rational. But, like Prajnaparamita, he's rejecting any intrinsically real cause and any intrinsically real effect. Do you follow me? A relational cause and effect, he is liberating from the prison of the false notions of their intrinsic reality. They, he is restoring their, our awareness of their relational reality, right? Which is the whole wisdom process. As I'm saying, he looks at causes. He doesn't look at causelessness. He looks at causes. When he looks at causes, he, he finds his habit of thinking that the cause is intrinsically really a cause, and then under that criterion, he doesn't find a cause. So he says, no cause. There never was anything produced ever and all this kind of thing, you know. Which is a big statement of nirvana. Nirvana means that this hasn't all happened. This is not happening now, nirvana means. It's, this is all uncreated, right here and now. <laughs> Which only means it's, it's not created intrinsically really. In this reality of its uncreatedness, that's the mirror surface. And on that surface are reflected all of these illusory, seemingly intrinsically real creations. Okay? But because they are in a surface of, of emptiness, of, of not finding, not being findable under analysis, of dissolving under analysis, therefore, 
uh, they are, we, we engage with them freely, and in a way they never really have been created. And so this is awareness of nir the simultaneous coinciding awareness of nirvana and samsara at the same time. So I don't know which translator said what, but they tend to, who, whoever, whatever person it is, they all tend to say, oh, he's a skeptic, he's nihilistic, he's not a real philosopher, he's just criticizing others, he doesn't have any view of his own, blah, blah, blah. They're all kind of nonsense about Nagarjuna. Because they, no one can deal with Nagarjuna, because no one can reject Nagarjuna. You know, in his own verse, chapter 24, in his own thing, he quotes a person saying, if all this is empty, then there's no noble truths, there's no cause and effect, nothing, you know, you, you've destroyed the universe. And he says, if all this is not empty, there's no cause and effect, there's no nirvana, no samsara, no four noble truths, etc. He goes on and on. The emptiness enables it all to happen because it assures it's, it's the emptiness of any non-relational element in it. So it allows it all to be relational. Do you follow? It's like the mirror, the fact that the mirror is empty of having a three-dimensional room inside it with a person's face, which you, when you look in the mirror, the fact that the mirror by itself is blank enables it to show you your reflection. And then your reflection looks like it's another person on the other side of a window. But since you know that it isn't, you don't have to think twice. You, have a no, you don't alternate between, oh, there's, there's, there's Bello in there. Bula, Bello, ba Balu. There's Balu in there. There's Balu in there. Oh, there's another Balu in there. Like a dog. Like we have a small puppy, a Pekingese puppy, and he barks at himself when he sees himself reflected in the doors, the glass doors. He gets all aggressive. He thinks there's another one in there. But, but you, you see Balu in there, and you know that that's not, you're, not, you're here. You know that. So you don't have to alternate and then think, oh, there's really blue, oh, no, 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 it's a mirror, oh no, oh, no, it's a mirror, no, it's a mirror, no. Because you have developed the tolerance of the cognitive dissonance of seeing yourself as if you were a three-dimensional person in there, and yet knowing you're just merely a reflection in a mirror. So you know the emptiness of the mirror surface. So that's the best analogy, the mirror thing, you know. But it's only an analogy because emptiness is not just something in which something happens. The happening itself is emptiness. So it's only an analogy. And the fact that all of this creation is uncreated is inconceivable. And therefore only tolerance of inconceivability enables us to actually live in it. And that tolerance of inconceivability leads to a bliss of melting our intrinsic reality and identity habits and objectivity habits into it. And then we really, we, we're we're uncreatedly running around amidst the creations, <laughs> and uh, and 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 we're ha we're happy. We're in nirvana when we know that. But that doesn't. We don't. We don't leave. We didn't leave town. It's just we realized there wasn't any town, and then we're very sorry for those people who are like trying to own the town, since you can't own it. Type of thing. Okay. How's that? That helps. Yes. Okay. Yes. Anyway, so I'm yeah. wondering why the Lam Rim is um, put out in stages since we tend to learn um, all the stages at once. We get different teachings about um, each of the different aspects um, um, out of order frequently. I'm just wondering what the Lam Rim does to make the teachings easy. Because I always see myself going to um, the second stage before anything else, and then going to well, renunciation. Well, that's not good. If you jump into compassion without really having compassion for yourself, real compassion, not the kind of compassion for yourself that makes you take pains with your hairdo. That is not true compassion for yourself. That, although that's a, that could be nice. It is a majestic hairdo. I completely agree. Thank but you. that is not true compassion for yourself if that were your main point which I'm sure it isn't in your case. I'm sure you're seeking to produce pleasure in those who see it. So you're being other regarding. But if you haven't first had true compassion for yourself, which is where you realize that it's not really that important what your hair looks like, mm -hmm. and it's not, it's, you have a low priority on it, and your real priority is at all times to be aware of the uncreatedness, in fact, of your hairdo. 
You know, when the people met Buddha, actually when they met Buddha, and he just said, "Come here, mendicant," their hair just all flew off. <laughs> <laughs> It actually flew off, and their clothes changed, and they had this uh, saffron robe on. That was the, his instant ordination, if you will, or graduation into the mendicant order, and they were completely blissfully happy to be out of having to pay taxes, having to earn a living, having to bring up a family, having to do any of those things. And they were living on a permanent, eternal free lunch, which that country was rich enough to offer them, and people were generous enough to give them, and they were then able to only focus on what was truly important. And it's not like a Western monk or nun who's kind of sort of flagellating themselves and their sinner qualities and so forth. No, it's like being a free person. The mendicant is therefore monk is a mistranslation. Bhikshu doesn't mean monk. Bhikshu means mendicant, someone who lives on alms. And homeless, purposefully homeless, not seeking, not owning a home, not pretending to own a home, but being at home everywhere. Actually, kim ne kim ne, you know, anagarika, as they call it, houselessness. That, but that was possible in such an advanced culture and wealthy culture as ancient India. And our culture, we, you know, we are. That's not possible. People go, America is the richest country. That's a bunch of baloney. We're totally broke. Hundred times over, we're broke. America already, because we wasted so much money in military expenditure over the years, which is a useless expenditure, and now we gave it all to the banksters, and they have created one thousand two hundred trillion dollars of CDOs and CDSs, for which they took commissions. If you want to wonder why they're so rich, meanwhile it's all worthless. 100% worth it. It just simply devalues the entire economy of the planet, and leads to Greece, and and yet they are being honored and and you know, you know Bernie Sanders is way right. I'm sorry, way right. Mm -hmm. And those who think they can get along with them and just take it, it'll be fine. You know, they're not being compassionate to them, because those people who have like sold the world one thousand two hundred. When the crash happened, there was only 800 trillion out there. Now there's 1,200 trillion. Anyway, sorry to, I didn't mean to be offensive about your hair, do. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> mentally, I saw your hair flying off, but don't go shave your head. I'd be embarrassed. I know. Don't, don't go become a mendicant. I know it's you, what stands. You can't be a mendicant in this culture because they won't feed you the free lunch. You understand? Mm -hmm. They won't. They'll say no free lunch. This We're an industrial society, and everybody has to work and be productive. And those women have to cut it out about being professionals and get back and have more babies, so we can sell those babies more baby food, and more pampers, and more things. <laughs> There, no, this, I'm, this guy from McKinsey, in some big conference, all these business guys. He said, "Hey, don't worry, guys. We're going to have nine billion people on the planet in about 25 years, and there are going to be three billion more in the middle class. So you can be selling to them, you know." What a complete lie, you know, complete demented, uninformed yeah. person. I had to get up and be party pooper and say, if you have three billion more in the, in the middle class, meaning having the same number of cars and same number of power plants and all this, you will have three billion dead at the bottom. And also there'll probably be no oxygen left on the entire planet for anybody to breathe at all. So... If the if the Chinese people had as many cars per capita as the American people, we'd be fin there'd be no oxygen. I believe this, there's a calculation like that. That would burn all the oxygen on the entire planet. <laughs> Just driving home, everyone would choke to death. So they're just so foolish, those people. But anyway, that's the way they are. Okay. Any other question? Are you happy? I'm sorry. I apologize. I do like your hair. It's very pleasant. No, it's okay. Don't worry too nice much about because, it. It's because it's why is it nice? Because it's not all neat and trimmed, and like mm -hmm. so I'm trying to let my eyebrows grow. <laughs> my barber tries to cut my eyebrows because they look kind of demonic when they get too long. But I have a friend who lets his grow, and, they, and he looks like a Zen master. And I have, I will never look like that. So I'm not really. But I just want to see what they do. So when she tries to go put her thing, it goes. Zzz. I'd say no, no, no. Let them grow. <laughs> of course, when they're hanging down on my face and I'm blinded, I guess I will trim them. 
you can find it. <laughs> what wow. Else? What else? Anything else? Let's see. Maybe we quit now. Oh, it's two minutes up. Anything? Any last more? Any last word? Last supper? Oh, yes. Okay. He wants to say what? I thought I would take the uh, pressure off about the hair uh, by asking a question. <laughs> That's a good air to do. <laughs> Thank like you. I like it very fly much. Off too. <laughs> the question I have is, you had mentioned the problem that when you were meditating and your <clears throat> Rinpoche came out and said, oh, why are you meditating? You yeah, yeah, and yeah. you said, be... Yeah, yeah, don't be, repeat. We know what it is. Yes, right, right. What's the question? So I recently had a, that, that deal where I was talking to a Buddhist monk and I was talking about a tantric practice. And for myself, I had a Kundalini awakening two years ago. And then was drawn to Kala Chakra, did the initiation, have a visionary practice, right? And so I had asked him, I said, well, what's the next stage? How do so I then move what? into the stage of completion? You know, if you're doing the said perfection, I call it. The what? I prefer the translation perfection. Oh, I like that, yeah. Stage of perfection, not completion, but go so ahead. He looked at me and he said, well, there are some people who could teach you further in Dharma Salah, but here's the problem is I... I don't think they would teach you. Yeah. It's the same exact pr pr problem, right? It's, it, to, to me, the message was, well, you're American. You haven't spent 40 years in a monastery, right? Uh, yes, you've done the initiation, but, you know. So it's like, what What's was your answer to that? What, what is the answer to practice? My answer to that is it's very time? good that you study about the stage of completion or perfection, if you will, mm. because then you might be able to imagine what would be possible. Mm. But if you try to do it without uh, first mastering the vision, visualization, visionary, what's called the stage of creation, better than development, but creation stage, where you recreate the universe in your imagination holographically, if you try to do it jumping ahead, it's very, very dangerous, and you'll likely go crazy. And uh, so, therefore, a person would be irresponsible to pretend to you that you can do a stage of perfection, just, just what the heck, you know, no problem. So, and you'll know that yourself if you read a good description of it. And I happen to have translated a book called The Brilliant Illumination of the Lamp, which you can find on the shelf out there. And if you read that, and patiently, it's, it's hundreds of pages, 500 pages, 600 pages, and you realize the different things, body isolation, speech isolation, mind isolation, um, non-dual, you know, illusion body, this kind of, or magic body, as I prefer to call it. You will see what's possible, at least according to the claim of the people who really did do it. And that will, might give you inspiration to really get back and master the vision thing and not be impatient and really learn it. And you have to learn that like when you go to art school. You have to find a lama who will teach you how to draw the mandala building, like that three-dimensional dollhouse. You have to learn to make one of those, also to draw the ornaments of the door and of the whole thing like that. And then all the different body, Kala Chakra, you have, you have 360, finger, 360 finger joints, thumb and finger joints, which are 360 days, and they have different colors, blue, red, and white, different colored fingernails, etc. And you have to learn where you can hold that all in your mind simultaneously. So you have to develop shamatha to do that. So it's a big job. It'll take years to do. And if you do that, then you will, it's, you, there, you'll naturally melt into the perfection stages. You'll begin to melt into the perfection stages. First you go creation stage, coarse creation stage, then you go subtle creation stage, then you'll melt into perfection. And reading about what it is, rather than just how do I get to do it, but reading actually what it is, may inspire you imaginatively to want to do the preliminary things that are required. And even to really do the visualization thing, you have to have the motivations of the lamrim. Because it's only that the lamrim is, I said, as I said at the beginning of today's class, the lamrim is considered the preliminary to being initiated and it having the motivation, proper motivation and safeguards to be uh, and, and initial level of wisdom, you have to fully understand what's called the royal reason of relativity before you can safely do the visualization. Because if you still have a, a, a un, unmediated, unremedied sense of absolutizing what you see, when you see internally in your visualization practice, like a holographic crystal diamond ruby mandala, you're going to absolutize that thing and you're going to go into a psychotic state. And then you're not going to be able to get out of that. 
you have to be able to melt, you have to realize that no matter how exquisite and magnificent a mandala is, or a deity body is, it's only a construct and it's only a relative thing, finally, also. Even the sense of Buddha identity is only a relative thing. You have to know that viscerally, not to become, not to shift habitual absolutism into these, you know, miraculous and ecstatic and exquisite, uh, exquisite visionary things, right? So that's why you need the wisdom. And you need the compassion so that when you start getting a little bit of energy, you don't get tempted to play around with magic and manipulate things and really get in trouble. And you have to have the renunciation in order to be able to not be swept away by the powerful energies that you will find in your own unconscious and become the victim and the slave of either Eros or Thanatos. Okay? So that's a labyrinth. That's why, that's why you need the labyrinth too. And, and you can't even get anywhere in the labyrinth until you're really viscerally aware of the infinity of this moment because it's causing your infinite future moments, not just in this life, your body of this life, but infinite future. Right? That makes it puts a huge intensity in this moment. Right, doesn't it? Okay? All the best. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody.